二十年前，在江宁，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，你问我，Ghost stories. I was deadly scared. A lot of torture place. A lot of people die there. We heard a voice about places we're not supposed to go. We're warned not to go. But I'm no ghost hunter. The fear, the superstition, always hides a bigger story, a true story. What really happened here? And if you knew, would you still go there? Joe, blogger and urban explorer. I'd been sent many reports of unexplained sightings in Nanjing. A footless girl in a black dress. A long-haired girl haunting separate universities. The rumor was this ancient capital was called something else. The city of lost souls, and one Nanjing district stood out more than the rest. A local resident believed that people in Jiangning were seeing spirits. I am Yang Fan, I'm a an administrator of a Nanjing paranormal forum. Since I was a kid, my friends and family have told me many paranormal experiences. I believe they are all true. One night, twenty years ago in Jiangning, a man was walking back to his house after using the toilet outside. Then he was startled by a voice from the bathroom. Then he saw shadows moving. Then he saw shadows moving. Then he saw shadows moving. There were people in army uniforms. And opposite them were civilians. The soldiers started shooting the men. Then the man was so frightened. He ran away. Then he ran away. Then he ran away. Then he ran away. Then he ran away. My theory is places that attract large numbers of paranormal sightings often have things hidden in their past. Was Jiang Ning the site of a military base or some battle? It was one of Nanjing's 11 districts. I had arrived in the hope that by finding the abandoned compound from Yang's story, I might find some clues as to what really happened here. All right, I think we've made it. We're on the outskirts of Jiangning. This must be the abandoned house where theoretically there was some sort of spirit sighting. I'm here to see if there is any sort of link between this building and the military and evidence of soldiers. So let's take a look around. This is pretty well destroyed. Not the type of destruction that would suggest like it was bombed out. But this has been around long enough to be pretty well messed up. 
Okay, it's properly dark now. I'm gonna switch to night vision. This is an odd place for it to have been placed. Cassette tapes. Someone was here in the 80s. You start to sense that this was a residential building. See some proper signs of life here. A couple of chairs beat up. Newspaper stuck to a wall. You can see December 2005. There is evidence that people lived here into the 2000s. At some point after that, obviously, uh, it's been abandoned. But I haven't found any evidence that suggests this building or this compound uh, had any military purpose. If I lived here and I had a midnight emergency, I would want to go someplace nearby, but not bother anyone else in the area. That looks as good of a place as any. Up this area, you can see some zoom in there. You see what looks like some rudimentary electric work. I feel like there might have been lights out here, like that right there. Uh, you can kind of imagine on that far wall there, if there was a light shining on this tree, you can kind of see here with just a little bit of wind, this tree casts all sorts of shadows on that wall. If you're in the right mindset, maybe groggy, possibly a little drunk. The shadows could look like anything. The man had believed he saw the spirits of soldiers. Then a similar story grabbed my attention. It was the same suburb as the last. Zhang Ning. 30 years ago,走出来一群人，可能是从某种空间里走出来。他看到那群人，他们反透明状，穿着军装，他们走着路，渐渐地离开了，消失掉。我同学看到非常害怕，非常恐怖。Both stories from Jiang Ning featured soldiers. My gut was telling me it must be a war or a conflict. But which one? Nanjing was an ancient capital of China for six different dynasties, and the capital for the Republic of China. There were many wars to choose from. The Opium War with the British, the 
Sino-Japanese War and the Chinese Civil War were all fought here. I returned to the area of Jiangming. Little had been gained from my first exploration. But I hoped that I might find a clue at the second sighting location that might connect these stories to a particular conflict or war. So I'm here out in Jiangning, which, you know, the story that I heard took place 30 years ago, and it felt like it was going to be some sort of rural farming village with a lot of fields, and obviously a really bustling, relatively modern village here. I'll take a look, see what's going on. The passage of time had made it hard to find things buried in the past. Since the story takes place on a bridge, it would have to be around water. This is the only waterway I found in this area, so if I keep looking, I think it has to be somewhere around here. It was dark, and I came across the main bridge in the area. Well, this isn't the most exciting place to explore. I had come hoping to find something like an old stone bridge, but this is it. Nothing here gives any hint of the age. So uh, I admit this isn't quite what I expected. Um, you know, it's not some old stone bridge. It's pretty modern, utilitarian, concrete. But on the plus side, I see a lot of people still around. So I'll talk to them. See if they've ever heard of it. Ni hao. Ni hao. Did you know the old stone bridge? I'm trying to find out about this story that takes place in Jiangming of of the spirits of soldiers marching across an old stone bridge. Have you heard of this story? So a lot of people around here have seen ghosts. This was unusual. Multiple people were experiencing paranormal encounters with soldiers all in one area. But my investigations to both locations didn't reveal any sign of military installations, past or present. I had a hunch that something sinister and dark happened here. But what conflict or war was responsible? I was in Nanjing, China, delving deep to a web of paranormal stories coming from one area, all involving soldiers. I needed to find out what battle or conflict may have inspired these sightings. Maybe the local belief system would reveal some answers. I knew one such person who connects the past life with the present. So I went in search of the local priest. We hold this kind of ceremony every year to release the souls of restless spirits who died in Nanjing. And what is the Chinese Buddhist belief about spirits? We Buddhists believe in the six paths of reincarnation. One of them is the ghost path. Historically, especially in Nanjing, many people died unnaturally. These spirits refuse to be reborn. As Buddhist followers, we help these souls to be appeased through chanting, hoping they can transcend to the better world. 
And why are there so many stories of spare sightings here in Nanjing? This question is related to Nanjing's history. A large number of people died here. That's why it's very common to have paranormal experiences in Nanjing. There are stories about the sightings of soldier spirits in Jiangling. Why might that be? Nanjing has seen many battles and wars in its history. But more civilians died here in World War II than any other wars. So speaking with a monk, I got a sense that uh, the Chinese Buddhist belief surrounding spirits deals with this idea that people who died a traumatic or unnatural death are stuck in between this life and the afterlife. I feel like it's also related, all of these stories, to the war history of Nanjing. So I'm going to look a little bit more into that. The monk mentioned there were many restless souls because a lot of people had died in Nanjing over many wars. But he gave me a clue. World War II had the most dead. The Japanese invaded China in 1937 and stayed here until 1945, the end of the Second World War. It meant China was at war longer than its Western allies. I searched Nanjing's historical archives working backwards, hoping the clues from the witness testimonies could link with the real historical story in the Jiangling area. I found a story there that would shock me. Going through these archives, I've come across an atrocity here that might be related to the story in Jiang Ning. Uh, it, it's so shocking, it's really hard to believe. Uh, a killing competition between two Japanese officers on the march into Nanjing from the southeast. This is something that I've got to look into. The war between China and Japan broke out in July 1937. By November, Japanese troops took control of Shanghai and soon advanced onto Nanjing with over 50,000 troops. What I'd found in the city's archives revealed that two officers randomly killed anyone they came across on the march into the city. The story was shocking even for wartime. I could understand that witnesses had seen people being killed, but how did they know what the motivations were? How did the Chinese know that these two Japanese officers were engaged in some sort of killing contest? I connected with Chinese historian, Professor Jing Shenghong, hoping he could shed some light on the killing competition. So, Professor, I'm trying to find evidence of this so-called killing competition. Could you tell me more about it? There were two young lieutenants in the troop. One was called Toshiaki Mukai. The other one was Tsuyoshi Noda. Their goal was to see who could be the first one that killed 100 people. When they were in Zhangzhou, they had already killed more than 50 people. On the 12th of December, 1937, at Zujin Mountain in Nanjing, one had already killed 106 people, and another one killed 105 people. We don't know which one reached 100 killings first. They decided to continue the killing competition, where the winner had to kill 150 people first. Professor Jing's account of the killing contest was vivid and detailed. But he didn't show me any proof. My investigation into the paranormal stories of Nanjing had been delivering new shocks at every turn. I tumbled down a rabbit hole of death and despair, exploring the story of a rumored killing contest said to have taken place here in 1937. 
The details of the killing contest are terrifying to the extreme. Some of it is still quite puzzling, which means I need to speak to someone who can give a first-hand account of exactly how brutal the Japanese soldiers were. I found an 88-year-old man who survived the Japanese assault in his hometown, Hushan Village, Jiangming. This village could have been on the path of the alleged killing contest. So what happened to the village in 1937? So what happened next? Tatiana Sugo Bao's story was pretty terrifying. He saw his brother and uncle killed in front of him. He was almost killed. The brutality in which they were killed was also really striking, and I feel like it kind of reminded me of the so-called killing competition. I was puzzled why the Japanese soldiers randomly killed innocent Chinese citizens. I called historian Rana Mitter in search of their possible motives. Why did the Japanese kill civilians? What we know from the eyewitness evidence at the time, that there seemed to be very little, if any, attempts by Japanese officers or by Japanese soldiers to differentiate between different sectors in the population. Let's not forget that for decades, many Japanese, including poor Japanese, have been told that they were superior, to other Asians within the region, including the Chinese. So in that context, it was very hard for the Japanese to see perhaps the Chinese civilians as simply ordinary equal civilians. And this unleashed this sort of strong, in some ways racially um, inflected idea that they were simply fair game. A sense of superiority could have been a pretext for the murders of Su Gobao's family as well as the two Japanese officers staging the killing contest using Chinese civilians as targets. I wanted to understand why two Japanese officers, men who were supposedly trained to lead and follow strict military discipline, did what they did. I needed proof that this was a premeditated contest. Professor Jing Sheng Hong had told me he had evidence of the killing contest. Professor, this is the proof that you were talking about as far as the killing competition? Yes. This was when those two fascist Japanese officers had their killing competition. A Japanese journalist followed them and reported the news. They published the story four times in the Japanese newspapers. Then these are the two officers in question? Yes, they were honored as warriors. But they were actually criminals that killed Chinese. Here's a book written by the famous Japanese journalist Honda Katsuichi. According to the information here, Tsuyoshi Noda, who returned to Japan after the killing competition, was giving a report. He admitted that he was in the 100 men killing competition. 
that stuff in the newspapers about the brave warrior from the provinces and the brave warrior of contest to cut down a hundred, that's about me. The two of us did have a contest, but afterward I was often asked whether it was a big deal, and I said that it was no big deal. So, what happened to these two men after the war? They were on trial at the Nanjing War Crimes Tribunal and sentenced to death. The story is getting stranger and stranger. You have two Japanese officers basically given free reign to go on a killing spree, uh, which manifests as some sort of competition. And on top of that, it's glorified in the Japanese papers. Now, why would you glorify something like this, even in the context of war? I had begun with stories of spirits of soldiers in a suburb of Nanjing, China that led to a killing contest by Japanese soldiers in 1937. What I found was even stranger. The Japanese glorified the killing competition in the local newspapers. What was the Japanese collective psyche like in 1937? For officers to commit such a crime and for the media to praise such acts. From the 1920s, the ultra-nationalists gained prominence in Japan. They wanted to unify Asia under their leadership against Western powers. This meant Japanese political domination of East Asia. But this imperialist policy was also a guise to grab land and set up colonies and mainland China became a target. After the Japanese invaded China in 1937, there were reports of dozens of massacres over a six-week period when Nanjing was first captured. It seems clear to me that the Japanese expansion into Nanjing was extremely bloody, it was a full-on massacre, and the atrocities committed here were for some reason glorified in Japan as propaganda. And I'm trying to understand that mindset. Well, they were in China. There is, uh, also the I turned to Professor Tim Brook, hoping he'd shed leaders. light on the Japanese so, media's role in wartime. Most countries' news media often play the role of a national cheerleader when they're at war. So maybe you can help me understand what role the Japanese media played uh, in Japan's 20th century expansion. The Japanese media in the 1930s was quite diverse, but as the military clamped down on dissenting opinion, the media largely uh, fell into line behind the government. There is uh, also the rather severe pressure of trying to attract readers. So journalists tended to look for sensational stories, for stories of Japanese soldiers performing superhuman tasks. And the story of the two Japanese officers engaged in a killing competition, that fits the mold? I was shocked to find out that the Japanese newspapers glorified it as some sort of uh, heroic deed. This is an interesting story in how the press works during wartime. Journalists need stories that portray their side as the heroes. It's generally accepted that the 100-man killing contest, as it's called, actually happened, except for a right-wing political faction in Japan, which doesn't think Japan committed any atrocities during World War II at all. This story was turning into something almost unbelievable, even for me soldiers killing civilians, being portrayed as heroes in Japan. I'm standing here in front of blown up versions of the actual articles printed in the Japanese papers at the time of the killing competition. These are the two men that took part. You even see the numbers listing kills per men. Uh, 
I've gone through the historical archive, but uh, reading about it is one thing. Seeing these graphic images in the film are a complete other experience. You just never get used to the gruesome level of violence depicted. Uh, it, it makes you wonder who could have ever let this happen, even within the context of war. Seeking to understand the collective trauma in Nanjing, I'd pursued a horrific story. Two Japanese army officers on a quest to see who could kill the most Chinese citizens. It led me to uncover an even more horrible crime. Japanese troops had killed tens of thousands of Chinese civilians. It wasn't a contest; it was a mass killing, labeled the Nanjing Massacre. What happened here went beyond the rules of war. Who let these men, under the flag of the rising sun, commit such crimes? I was looking through archives to understand the chain of command in the Japanese army during the assault of Nanjing. It seemed there were technically two commanders. One was General Matsui Iwane, the commander of all Japanese forces in China. The other one was Prince Yasuhiko Asaka, the emperor's uncle. There seems to have been two commanders in charge of the Japanese Imperial Army in Nanjing: General Matsui and Prince Asaka. And you have to wonder if there was some sort of conflict of power. I had hoped that meeting with Professor Wang Wei Xing would help me figure out who was in charge. My understanding is that there were two commanders during the invasion of Nanjing: General Matsui. And Prince Asaka, I would like to know why that was the case. Their highest commander was General Masui, but since Asaka was a royal family member, Masui was very respectful to him. Perhaps you could help me understand better why did this attack on Nanjing lead to a massacre? What made it different from the other attacks? The Japanese massacre in Nanjing can be characterized into two types. One type is large-scale killing. After the Japanese military took over Nanjing, many Chinese soldiers couldn't back out of Nanjing. On the 13th of December 1937, they started a large-scale searching and killing operation. Another type is Japanese soldiers wandering around Nanjing. Committing independent acts of killing, ripping, and robbery. Was there a command to act that way, and and who gave that command? On the 12th of December 1937, the Japanese sent troop number 13 from Shanghai to attack Nanjing. They captured around 15,000 to 20,000 Chinese soldiers. Then they got the command to kill them all. With authority in Shanghai, the commander of the expeditionary army was named Asaka Yasuhiko. I had wondered why the Japanese army killed these prisoners of war. It was against international law. Then I found a clue. On August 5, 1937. Central military officials in Tokyo told their troops in China that they didn't consider the conflict a full-scale war, meaning any Chinese captured were not protected by international conventions. At some point, there must have been a command for all of this to stop.、Uh, I'm trying to figure out when was that command given and did it work. After Masui found out what was happening in Nanjing. On the afternoon of the 18th, he reprimanded his subordinate. It was just a verbal warning. Nothing more was done to stop the killing. 
General Matsui had made some attempt to put a stop to the massacre. But it continued, and his orders were not enforced. My investigation here has turned darker and darker, and yet two key questions remain. In the aftermath of the Nanjing massacre, did the Japanese face retribution or justice for the war crimes they committed? And what of the victims? How did they learn to cope with the memories of what they had lived through? I'd found the reason why some people called Nanjing the city of lost souls. Shortly before World War II, the Japanese military had committed a massacre here of incomprehensible proportions. It was time to find out if justice had been served to the persecutors of this tragic event. I had visited the Nanjing Massacre Memorial Hall to find out what happened to the Japanese military commanders General Matsui and Prince Asaka after the war. This is General Matsui standing in front of the International Military Tribunal for the Far East. The tribunal found that he knew what was happening during the Nanjing Massacre and he failed to put a stop to it and was ultimately responsible. They found him guilty, they sentenced him to death, and they executed him. Prince Asaka, as well as Emperor Hirohito, were not prosecuted, in part due to the pact that granted the imperial family immunity from prosecution at the end of World War II. But I'd gone some way into uncovering what had really happened here why the killings took place. But I'd not yet understood how the living had survived. So the trauma of the Nanjing Massacre, how has that affected the, the survivors and their families? The Nanjing Massacre has been the most tragic event in the city's history. Nanjing itself is a city of sadness. Although half a century has passed, on the surface, the people of Nanjing have seemingly forgotten about this matter. But the memory of the massacre is always in the air. With small scuffles between China and Japan happen, Nanjing will immediately be remembered. So how have the people of Nanjing coped since then? Life is very fragile. But we have to look forward. To be able to look forward, we need an ending to the past. I think for the victors and the victims to resolve the issue, there must be a prerequisite, a sincere apology. Before I left the city, I visited the Nanjing Massacre Memorial Hall one last time. It turned out to be an auspicious day. Too many day. A Chinese tradition to remember the dead. Su Guo Ba, whose family were killed by the Japanese, showed me their tomb. This one up here? Uh, this one up here. You saw the names of your relatives. How did that make you feel? Oh, 
The story of the Nanjing massacre is more brutal and tragic than I could have ever imagined. The war may have been over for 70 years, but the grief still remains. Thank you.